Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel. And today's topic of discussion is series DC circuit properties. Our objective is to examine the fundamental properties of series DC circuits, including Kirchhoff's voltage law. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a nodding acquaintance with DC Ohm's law, power, and series resistance calculations. If at any time you feel you're over your head, please take the time to click the provided links to bring yourself up to speed. A circuit is a complete conductive path or a closed loop. A closed loop could be a single circular, rectangular, triangular, or any other shape forming a complete loop or composed of many different pathways that at least one of which connects one terminal of a voltage source to the other. Without at least a single closed loop, there is no circuit and there is no way conventional current can flow from the positive terminal of a source to a negative terminal. A closed circuit requires a closed path for current to flow. Circuits composed of multiple resistors can assume numerous different configurations, perhaps the simplest being a series or an inline configuration. A series arrangement means there is one path and one path only. Here's one example of a series circuit consisting of a 12 volt source and R1 having a value of 330 ohms and R2 having a value of 560 ohms. If we were to visualize conventional current flowing through the system, you'll note current would leave the positive terminal of the source and travel into resistor 1, through resistor 1, out of resistor 1, into resistor 2, through resistor 2, out of resistor 2, and into the negative terminal of the source. One path for current exists in simple series circuits. Identical equivalent configurations of this same circuit exist. The commonality being there exists one and only one path for current. Regardless of the configuration employed, two important observations can be made. One, series resistances add up. For this series circuit, consisting of a 330 ohm resistor in series with a 560 ohm resistor, the source sees a total resistance of 330 plus 560, or 890 ohms. This implies the 12 volt source would be none the wiser if the series combination of two resistors was swapped out and a single 890 ohm resistor took their place. This easier visualization can be used to simplify the analysis procedure. Making use of this simplification, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that the 12 volt source would push roughly 13.5 milliampers of current through this circuit. A subsequent application of the power equation demonstrates that the source would be supplying roughly 161.8 milliwatts of power. Two. Any current emanating from the source must travel through both resistors, implying that current anywhere in this single series path is the same. An ammeter inserted anywhere in the circuit would measure 13.5 milliampers regardless of placement. For example, an ammeter inserted between the positive terminal of the source and R1 would read roughly 13.5 milliampers, as would an ammeter inserted between R1 and R2 as would an ammeter inserted between R2 and the negative terminal of the source. In short, current through elements in series is the same. In this scenario, source current equals the current through R1, which equals the current through R2. I source equals I1 equals I2, and they all equal 13.5 milliampers. I say again, current through elements in series is the same. This is perhaps the most fundamental property of series circuits and we'll have ample time and occasion to use this property on a regular basis to simplify the analysis procedure. Let's now examine the voltage drops across individual elements inside this series circuit. Given we know current through both elements to be roughly 13.5 milliampers, and the fact that we know the resistance of both elements, it's a simple matter of applying Ohm's law to each individual resistor. The voltage drop across R1 will be equal to the current through it times its resistance. V1 equals I1 times R1. Similarly, the voltage drop across R2 will be equal to the current through it times its resistance. V2 equals I2 times R2. Before we substitute in our given values, let's make a prediction. Given current through each resistor is the same, and voltage is equal to current times resistance, it stands to conjecture that a smaller resistor will drop a smaller amount of voltage, and a larger resistor will drop a larger amount of voltage. I am willing to wager R1 at 330 ohms will drop comparatively less voltage than R2 at a larger 560 ohms. Let's see if this is the case. Substituting in our given values for V1 demonstrates the voltage drop across R1 will be roughly 4.4 volts. Substituting in our given values for V2 demonstrates the voltage drop across R2 will be roughly 7.6 volts. As predicted, the larger resistor in this series circuit 
drops more voltage and the small resistor less. Let's add this observation to our list of series circuit properties. So far we've observed the following to be true. 1. Series resistors add up. 2. Current through elements in series is the same. 3. The largest resistor in a series circuit drops the largest amount of voltage and the smallest resistor in a series circuit drops the smallest amount of voltage. Yet another fundamental series circuit property lies easily within our grasp. The observant among you will note that the summation of voltage drops, V1 plus V2, equals the voltage rise induced by the source E, 4.4 plus 7.6 equals 12 volts. In summary, what goes up must come down. This is Kirchhoff's voltage law, yet another fundamental series circuit property. Let's add this to our list. 1. Series resistors add up. 2. Current through elements in series is the same. 3. The largest resistor in a series circuit drops the largest amount of voltage, and the smallest resistor in a series circuit drops the smallest amount of voltage. And 4. For any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises equals the summation of voltage drops. In summary, what goes up must come down. Lastly, let's consider power dissipated by individual elements in this system. As we previously demonstrated, the source is known to supply roughly 161.8 milliwatts of power to this system. Given power input must equal power output, allow me to make yet another prediction. This prediction being that the summation of power dissipated by each individual element in this system will be equal to the power supplied to this system. P total equals P1 plus P2. Let's see if this is the case. The power dissipated by R1 is equal to the voltage across it times the current through it. P1 equals V1 times I1. Substituting in our given values demonstrates R1 dissipates roughly 60 milliwatts of power. Similarly, the power dissipated by R2 is equal to the voltage across it times the current through it. P2 equals V2 times I2. Substituting in our given values demonstrates that R2 dissipates roughly 101.8 milliwatts of power. As we predicted, power in does indeed equal power out. 60 milliwatts plus 101.8 milliwatts does in fact equal the total 161.8 milliwatts of power supplied to the system by the source. Given these power figures, yet more fundamental observations can be made about series circuits at this time. Given current through elements in series is the same, not only does the smallest resistor experience the smallest voltage drop, it also dissipates the smallest amount of power. Conversely, not only does the largest resistor experience the largest voltage drop, it also dissipates the largest amount of power. Let's add these observations and the fact that power input to a system always equals power output to our growing list of series circuit properties. 1. Series resistors add up. For this circuit, R total equals R1 plus R2. 2. Current through elements in series is the same. For this circuit, I source equals I1, which equals I2. 3. The largest resistor in a series circuit drops the largest amount of voltage, and the smallest resistor in a series circuit drops the smallest amount of voltage. 4. For any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises equals the summation of voltage drops. In summary, what goes up must come down. For this circuit, the rise induced by the source E equals the summation of drops V1 plus V2. 5. Power in equals power out. For this circuit, P total equals P1 plus P2. And finally, 6. The largest resistor in a series circuit dissipates the largest amount of power, and the smallest resistor in a series circuit dissipates the smallest amount of power. These observations constitute fundamental properties for all series DC circuits and serve as both a great way of simplifying the analysis procedure and an excellent means of checking your work. If your calculations suggest conclusions not in agreement with these properties, you are doing it wrong and you need to perform a tactical retreat and reassess your numbers. Let's put your understanding of series circuit properties to the test with this illustrated example. Consider the series circuit consisting of a 24 volt source, R1 having a value of 620 ohms, R2 having a value of 240 ohms, and R3 having a value of 470 ohms. Let's walk through this analysis step by step. First, see if you can determine the total resistance seen by the source. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Series resistances add up. 
620 plus 240 plus 470 equals 1330 ohms or roughly 1.3 kilo ohms. This implies the 24 volt source would be none the wiser if the series combination of three resistors was swapped out and a single 1330 ohm resistor took their place. This easier visualization can be used to simplify the analysis procedure. See if you can use this simplification to solve for the current produced and the power supplied by the source. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Source current supply voltage over total resistance. Substituting our given values yields roughly 18 milliamperes. Power is voltage times current. Substituting in our given values yields roughly 433.1 milliwatts of power. Now, let's see if you can use the fundamental series circuit properties to make some predictions without calculations. See if you can predict which resistor will experience the largest individual voltage drop and which one will experience the smallest individual voltage drop. Which one will dissipate the largest amount of power and which one will dissipate the smallest amount of power. Finally, see if you can determine current through each individual resistor, the summation of individual voltage drops, and the summation of power dissipated by individual elements in the system. Again, no calculations are permitted. Just think about it. Use fundamental series circuit properties to predict these results. If you're tracking, we should have arrived at the following conclusions. The largest resistor in a series circuit both drops the largest amount of voltage and dissipates the most amount of power. R1 at 620 ohms will most likely experience the largest voltage drop and dissipate the most power. Conversely, the smallest resistor in a series circuit drops both the smallest amount of voltage and dissipates the least amount of power. R2 at 240 ohms will most likely experience the smallest voltage drop and dissipate the least amount of power. We might expect the voltage drop in power dissipated by R3 at 470 ohms, roughly midway between R1 and R2, to be midway between these upper and lower extremes. Current through elements in series is the same because there is one and only one path for current. In this scenario, source current equals the current through R1, which equals the current through R2, which equals the current through R3, and they all equal roughly 18 milliamperes. I source equals I1, which equals I2, which equals I3, which equals 18 milliamperes. Given the direction of conventional current travel, we would expect voltage drops across the individual elements, positive to negative, top to bottom. In regards to the summation of individual voltage drops, we know that for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises will be equal to the summation of voltage drops. In this case, there is one voltage rise induced by the 24 volt source and three voltage drops, V1, V2, and V3. Therefore, E equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. Similarly, in regards to the summation of power dissipated by individual elements, we know that power in equals power out. We know the source is supplying roughly 433.1 milliwatts of power, so P1 plus P2 plus P3 should equal our total power of 433.1 milliwatts. Given these predictions, we've got a well-defined landing zone inside which we anticipate our results to drop. If any results fall outside the zone, they're wrong and we need to revisit our calculations. Let's see if our predictions come true. Again, let's do this in a step-by-step -step fashion. See if we can use Ohm's law and the power equations to solve for the voltage drop across and the power dissipated by R1 and R2 only. Do not solve for these same properties for R3 at this time. Again, see if you can use Ohm's law and the power equations to solve for the voltage drop across and the power dissipated by R1 and R2 only. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The voltage drop across R1 will be equal to the current through it times its resistance. V1 equals I1 times R1. We know R1 by virtue of being in a series circuit carries roughly 18 milliamps of current through it, as does everything else in this system. Substituting our given values demonstrates V1 to be roughly 11.2 volts. The power dissipated by R1 is equal to the voltage across it times the current through it. P1 equals V1 times I1. Substituting in our given values demonstrates R1 dissipates roughly 201.9 milliwatts of power. Similarly, the voltage drop across R2 will be equal to the current through it times its resistance. V2 equals I2 times R2. Again, we know R2, by virtue of being in a series circuit, carries roughly 18 milliamperes of current through it, as does everything else in this system. 
Substituting in our given values demonstrates V2 to be roughly 4.3 volts. Similarly, the power dissipated by R2 is equal to the voltage across it times the current through it. P2 equals V2 times I2. Substituting in our given values demonstrates R2 dissipates roughly 78.2 milliwatts of power. You'll note the other permutations of the power equation, such as voltage squared divided by resistance and current squared times resistance for individual resistors yield the same results. Using these different permutations, solving for the same property are a great way of checking your work. Ideally, both results should yield the same value. Let's clean up our workspace and see if our predictions we made came true. As we predicted, the voltage dropped across the largest resistor R1 is indeed larger than the voltage dropped across the smaller resistor R2. Similarly, the power dissipated by the larger resistor R1 is indeed larger than the power dissipated by the smaller resistor R2. All that remains is to solve for these same properties for R3. Yes, we could use Ohm's law in the power equations as we did for R1 and R2. However, let's make use of Kirchhoff's voltage law, which states for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises will be equal to the summation of voltage drops. And our understanding of power, or power in, always equals power out. Let's look at voltage distribution first. In this case, there's one voltage rise of 24 volts and three voltage drops, V1, V2, and V3. Therefore, V1 plus V2 plus V3 equals our supply voltage E of 24 volts. We've solved for both V1 and V2 through manipulations of Ohm's law. These are now known quantities, as is our supply voltage of 24 volts. Only one unknown exists in this equation, that being V3. Solve for V3. An algebraic manipulation of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this circuit demonstrates that V3 equals our supply voltage E minus V1 minus V2. Substituting in our known supply voltage and our previously calculated values for V1 and V2 demonstrates that V3 will be the remaining 8.5 volt drop. This seems correct, being a value between the largest and smallest voltage drop. Let's use Ohm's law to confirm this result. The voltage drop across R3 will be equal to the current through it times its resistance. V3 equals I3 times R3. We know R3, by virtue of being in a series circuit, carries roughly 18 milliampers of current through it, as does everything else in this system. Substituting our given values demonstrates V3 to be roughly 8.5 volts. O M G. It's the same answer we obtained using an algebraic manipulation of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this circuit. This is not a happy coincidence, but rather a system of checks and balances. There is one right answer, and all methods will yield this same right answer. Of note, the algebraic manipulation in the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for this circuit necessitates only addition and subtraction, whereas Ohm's law necessitates multiplication and division, by no means impossible tasks. However, Kirchhoff's voltage law is stupidly simple and you'd be a fool not to make use of it to check your work. For example, let's say you totally screwed up calculating voltage across R2, and instead of entering 240 ohms into the voltage drop equation, you entered 290 ohms. Roughly 18 milliampers times an incorrect resistance of 290 ohms yields an incorrect voltage of roughly 5.2 volts. Let's say we did everything else correctly though. But when we add 11.2 volts plus 5.2 volts plus 8.5 volts, they don't equal the anticipated 24 volts, but rather 24.9 volts. We know something is wrong and we can stop the roller coaster and get off before someone gets hurt. A quick inspection of your results and the calculations leading to those results should reveal the source of your problems, namely the incorrect substitution of 290 ohms into an Ohm's law calculation when it should have been 240 ohms. See if you can use your understanding of power in a similar manner to determine the power dissipated by the remaining resistor R3. Power in equals power out. For this system, power total equals P1 plus P2 plus P3. We know total power input to this system and we just calculated P1 and P2. See if you can algebraically manipulate the power equation to solve for P3 and then verify this result with one permutation of the power equation. What the hell? Verify this result with all three permutations of the power equation. Ideally, all methods should yield the same result. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An algebraic manipulation of the power equation for this circuit, solving for P3, 
demonstrates that P3 equals P total minus P1 minus P2. Substituting our previously calculated values for total power, P1 and P2, demonstrates that P3 is the remaining 153 milliwatts. As we anticipated, it's a value between the largest and smallest power. Let's use the power equations to confirm this result. Any and all versions of the power equation demonstrates R3 will dissipate 153 milliwatts of power. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence these results are correct. Before we move on, take a moment to reflect not upon the minute details of calculation, but rather the larger procedure we used to solve for the desired properties of this system. At no point did we wander off the path and start blindly thrashing through a thorny tangle of blackberry bushes uncertain of our destination. At all times we are aware and informed of our goals and those pieces of knowledge leading to those goals. We took an inventory of what we did know and we used items in this inventory to quickly arrive and confirm our results. As a result, we got the correct results the first time in the quickest manner possible. This is the standard of success. Circuit analysis at its core is an understanding of the fundamental properties of those circuits under inspection and then putting them to use in an organized fashion. For series circuits, these properties are as follows. 1. Series resistors add up. 2. Current through elements in series is the same. 3. The largest resistor in a series circuit drops the largest amount of voltage and the smallest resistor in a series circuit drops the smallest amount of voltage. 4. Kirchhoff's voltage law, which states for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises equals the summation of voltage drops. In summary, what goes up must come down. 5. Power in equals power out. And finally, 6. The largest resistor in a series circuit dissipates the largest amount of power, and the smallest resistor in a series circuit dissipates the smallest amount of power. Finally, finally, Ohm's law and the power equations work all the time. They work for individual elements and simplifications of larger circuits. You can use Ohm's law at night, all day long, right side up, upside down, underwater, or out in space. You simply cannot exist, let alone function without Ohm's law. Get good at Ohm's law and use it often. Use Ohm's law like a Viking would use a battle axe in a town of screaming peasants. Smash everything you see with Ohm's Law until you run out of things to smash. Beyond a knowledge of these fundamental properties and an aptitude for calculation, one must be systematic and organized. I'm sorry, but I cannot teach you to be organized. That was your mama's job. My advice is to write down intermediate simplifications and results. That way you can always return to these values at later points to check your work. Use the history in your calculator. Only round the final answer. Use unrounded numbers for all calculation purposes. Keep track of where you are and at the very least, know where you're supposed to be going. It's worth noting that Kirchhoff's voltage law and power in equals power out are both extremely handy methods for shortcutting exhaustive calculations or checking your work as they necessitate only simple addition and subtraction. You would be a fool not to use these simple techniques. Because these techniques are so simple and so powerful, Let's spend a little more time examining this circuit using Kirchhoff's voltage law. You'll sometimes hear me refer to Kirchhoff's voltage law in acronym form as KVL and use it as a verb as in KVL that POS, meaning perform a detailed Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this circuit and you'll arrive at the answers you seek. KVL has far greater use than its outwardly simple appearance may suggest. Allow me to demonstrate. If we were to list the electrical properties of this circuit, it would look something like this. The 24 volt source provides roughly 18 milliampers of current and 433.1 milliwatts of power to a circuit that has a total resistance of 1330 ohms. R1, a 620 ohm resistor, experiences roughly 18 milliampers of current, an 11.2 volt drop, and dissipates roughly 201.9 milliwatts of power. R2, a 240 ohm resistor, experiences roughly 18 milliampers of current, a 4.3 volt drop, and dissipates roughly 78.2 milliwatts of power. Finally, R3, a 470 ohm resistor, experiences roughly 18 milliampers of current, an 8.5 volt drop, and dissipates 153 milliwatts of power. Given conventional current travels in this series circuit in the clockwise direction, the voltage drops across each resistor would be oriented positive to negative, top to bottom. 
Let's add the following lettered nodes to this circuit, A, B, C, and D. Using double subscript notation, we can call the voltage drop across resistor 1, VAB, the voltage drop across resistor 2, VBC, and the voltage drop across resistor 3, VCD. This should not be that big of a stretch of the imagination. Voltage is a two-point measurement and using double subscript notation and makes it stupidly obvious which two nodes we're talking about. You recall that KVL states that for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises equals the summation of voltage drops. In summary, what goes up must come down. Let's explore the KVL equation for this circuit in a slow and deliberate manner. Later on, you can do this as fast as you want, but use this slow pace to let this concept sink in. We need to travel a closed loop and keep track of the voltage rises and drops we encounter on this loop. Think about the term loop. A loop implies a closed path that ends where it starts and starts where it ends. Let's say we start at node D, the bottom of R3 and the negative terminal of the source, and then travel clockwise through this system, D to A, A to B, B to C, and C back to D. Traveling from D to A, we go in the source negative and come out a positive. This is a 24 volt rise. Let's put this on the left hand side of the equation where all the rises go. Where are we on this loop with respect to our starting point? Considering our starting point D, A is clearly 24 volts higher than D. It makes sense. Continuing to travel from A to B, we go in a positive and come out a negative. This is an 11.2 volt drop. Let's put this on the right hand side of the equation where all the drops go. Where are we now with respect to our starting point D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts. And then from A to B, we dropped 11.2 volts. It stands to conjecture B is a rise of 24 volts less a drop of 11.2 volts or 12.8 volts higher than D. We'll come back to this observation in a moment. Continuing to travel from B to C, we again go in a positive and come out a negative. This is a 4.3 volt drop. Let's put this on the right hand side of the equation where all the drops go. Where are we now with respect to our starting point D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts. Then from A to B, we dropped 11.2 volts. And then from B to C, we dropped another 4.3 volts. It stands to conjecture, C is a rise of 24 volts, less a drop of 11.2 volts, less a drop of 4.3 volts, or 8.5 volts higher than D. We'll come back to this observation in a moment. Finally, completing the loop, traveling from C to D, we again go in a positive and come out a negative. This is an 8.5 volt drop. Let's put this on the right hand side of the equation where all the drops are going. Where are we now with respect to our starting point D? Well, that's a stupid question because we're at D and D should have no difference with respect to D because of the same damn point. But for the sake of completion, let's play this stupid game. From D to A, we rose 24 volts. Then from A to B, we dropped 11.2 volts. From B to C, we dropped another 4.3 volts. And from C back to D, we dropped another 8.5 volts. It stands to conjecture, D is a rise of 24, less a drop of 11.2, less a drop of 4.3, less another drop of 8.5, or zero volts higher than D. As we anticipated, no differential exists between D and itself. As KVL suggests, for this closed loop, does the summation of voltage rises equal the summation of voltage drops? 11.2 plus 4.3 plus 8.5 does indeed equal 24 volts. Think of the points we stopped along the way. A is 24 volts higher than D. B is 24 minus 11.2 or 12.8 volts higher than D. C is 24 minus 11.2 minus 4.3 or 8.5 volts higher than D. If we were to use a variation of double subscript notation, where we were to assume point D, our point of reference for all voltage measurements, VA would be 24 volts higher than D, VB would be 12.8 volts higher than D, and VC would be 8.5 volts with respect to D. Again, you will note each nodal voltage is with respect to D. Using this method, point-to-point -point differentials can still be calculated. For example, what is VAB? VAB would be VA at 24 volts, minus VB at 12.8 volts. 
24 minus 12.8 yields VAB to be 11.2 volts to absolutely no one's surprise. Similarly, what is VBC? VBC would be VB at 12.8 volts minus VC 8.5 volts. 12.8 volts minus 8.5 volts yields VBC to be 4.3 volts, again to absolutely no one's surprise. You'll note sometimes circuits make use of a ground reference. Customarily, the source's negative terminal is ground referenced, although other grounding schemes exist. For example, if the source's negative terminal at node D was electrically connected to ground, we could use some other grounded object as a reference point for all voltage measurements. Let's say the circuit was housed in a grounded metal frame. Point A would be 24 volts higher than the grounded frame, point B would be 12.8 volts higher than the grounded frame and point C would be 8.5 volts higher than the grounded frame. At times, circuits including a ground reference can be drawn a little oddly. Given the negative terminal of the source and the bottom of R3 are both connected to the grounded D node, you might see the circuit drawn like this. At first glance, it seems like there's no complete circuit. However, you will note the ground symbol on either end implies that this is a pooled connection. We'll examine ground connection in later lectures on circuit protection. Consider this subtle modification of the original circuit where I combine R2 and R3 into one 710 ohm resistor. 240 ohms plus 470 ohms equals 710 ohms. How will this affect nodal voltages in this circuit and current through it? Take your time and think about this. If you're tracking, you should realize not a lot changes when we make this modification. 620 ohms in series with 710 ohms still yields a total resistance of 1330 ohms and under this impression, the source will still provide roughly 18 milliamps of current. From R1's perspective, absolutely nothing changes. With 18 milliamps of current traveling through it, it will still experience an 11.2 volt drop. Given an 11.2 volt drop from A to B, where are we at B with respect to D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts and then dropped 11.2 volts. So at B, we must be 12.8 volts higher than D. What has changed is that we've lost access to an intermediate stopping point, node C, along the way from B to D. This means that the 710 ohm resistor must experience the remaining roughly 12.8 volt drop. Kirchhoff's voltage law says so. What goes up must come down. It's got to be 12.8 volts. My question to you is this. What is the current through a 710 ohm resistor experiencing a 12.8 volt drop? Well, it's got to be 18 milliamperes because current through elements in series is the same. Let's use Ohm's law to confirm this fact. Current is voltage over resistance. Substituting our given values does indeed yield roughly 18 milliamperes. Can you now appreciate how Ohm's law and properties like Kirchhoff's voltage law are the chicken before the egg, before the chicken, before the egg, before the chicken, before the egg? Can you dig this on every level that I do? But wait, that's not all. You'll note we traveled the loop in the original circuit clockwise from point D through a voltage rise followed by three voltage drops in succession. This is probably the easiest and most sensible way of doing it since we follow the direction of conventional current. What's great about KVL is even if you do it the hard and stupid way, you will still get a correct answer as long as you end where you start and remain consistent with regards to polarity. Anytime you go in a negative and come out a positive, it is considered a rise. Every time you go in a positive and come out a negative, it is considered a drop. Let's say we start at node B and travel back to B in the counterclockwise direction. This is hard and stupid, but as long as we remain consistent, we should get a right answer. Traveling from B to A, we go in a negative and come out a positive. This is an 11.2 volt rise. We know R1 is a passive element and it's actually dropping voltage. However, given this foolish choice of travel direction, we're going to consider it a rise. Let's put this on the left hand side of the equation where all the rises go. Continuing to travel counterclockwise from A to D, we go in a positive and come out a negative. This is a 24 volt drop. Again, we know the source is an active element and it's actually sourcing voltage. However, given this foolish choice of travel direction, we're going to consider a drop. Let's put this on the right hand side of the equation where all the drops go. Continuing to travel counterclockwise from D to C, we go in a negative and come out a positive. This is an 8.5 volt rise. 
Let's put this on the left-hand side of the equation where all the rises go. Finally, completing the counterclockwise loop, traveling from C to B, we again go in a negative and come out a positive. This is a 4.3 volt rise. Let's put this on the left-hand side of the equation where all the rises go. As KVL suggests, for this closed loop, does the summation of voltage rises equal the summation of voltage drops? 24 does indeed equal 11.2 plus 4.3 plus 8.5. Kirchhoff's voltage law works, even though we did it the hard and stupid way. Let this be a small consolation to your lazy lab partner. Most likely, even they can get this right, provided they can show up to class on time, which might be too much to ask. Although you can get usable results in either direction, my sincere recommendation is to always travel in the direction of conventional current. This makes it astoundingly easy to recognize voltage rises established by active sources, i.e. in a negative and out a positive, and voltage drops experienced by passive elements, i.e. in a positive and out a negative. Additionally, if the circuit includes a ground reference, I customarily start at the ground reference node and come back to it. Lacking the ground reference, I normally start at the source negative terminal and come back to it traveling in the direction of conventional current. Again, anytime you go in a negative and come out a positive, consider it a rise, and every time you go in a positive and come out a negative, consider it a drop. As long as you end where you start and remain consistent regarding polarity, you cannot get this wrong. Moving on, consider rearrangement of elements inside series circuits. Compare and contrast the original circuit with this modified circuit where R3 and R1 have swapped places. If we were to perform a series circuit analysis of this modified circuit, we find the source still sees 470 plus 240 plus 620, or 1,330 ohms of total resistance, and still pushes roughly 18 milliampers of conventional current clockwise through this system. As a result, R3 still experiences an 8.5 volt positive to negative top to bottom. R2 still experiences a 4.3 volt drop positive to negative top to bottom and R1 still experiences an 11.2 volt drop positive to negative top to bottom. In short, nothing experienced by the individual elements changes. What does change is the nodal voltages for the larger circuit. Although the entire 24 volt rise induced by the source is still inevitably dropped in this series circuit, the voltage drops are apportioned differently between these nodes. As an exercise of the viewer, I invite you to use Kirchhoff's voltage law to calculate voltage at node A with respect to D, voltage at node B with respect to D, and voltage at node C with respect to D for the modified circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Let's start at node D and travel clockwise in the direction of conventional current. D to A, A to B, B to C, C back to D. This is the easiest and most sensible way of KVLing this circuit. If you did it in any other manner, you did it wrong. Traveling from D to A, we go in a source negative and come out a positive. This is a 24 volt rise. Let's put this on the left hand side of the equation where all the rises go. Where are we now on this loop with respect to our starting point? Considering our starting point D, A is clearly 24 volts higher than D. This makes sense. If you wanted to be hard headed about this and travel counterclockwise from D to A, you'd still get the same answer because D to C is an 11.2 volt rise. C to B is a 4.3 volt rise, and B to A is an 8.5 volt rise. 11.2 plus 8.5 plus 4.3 is still a 24 volt rise. Like I said, you can do this totally wrong and still get a right answer as long as you remain consistent with polarity. Continuing to travel from A to B, we go in a positive and come out a negative. This is an 8.5 volt drop. Let's put this on the right hand side of the equation where all the drops will go. Where are we now with respect to our starting point D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts, and then from A to B, we dropped 8.5 volts. It stands to conjecture B with respect to D is a rise of 24 volts, less a drop of 8.5 volts, or 15.5 volts higher than D. VB with respect to D would be 15.5 volts. Again, if you wanted to be hard headed about this and travel counterclockwise from D to B, you'd still get the same answer. Because D to C is an 11.2 volt rise, and C to B is a 4.3 volt rise. 11.2 plus 4.3 is a 15.5 volt rise. Either way you look at it, B is 15.5 volts higher than D. Continuing to travel from B to C, we again go in a positive and come out a negative. This is a 4.3 volt drop. Let's put this on the right hand side of the equation where all the drops go. Where are we now with respect to the starting point D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts, 
Then from A to B, we dropped 8.5 volts. And from B to C, we dropped another 4.3 volts. It stands to conjecture, C is a rise of 24 volts, less a drop of 8.5 volts, less a drop of 4.3 volts, or only 11.2 volts higher than D. VC, with respect to D, would be 11.2 volts. Again, if you wanted to be hard-headed about it and travel counterclockwise from D to C, you'd still get the same answer, because D to C is an 11.2 volt rise. Either way you look at it, C is 11.2 volts higher than D. Finally, completing the loop, traveling from C to D, we again go in a positive and come out a negative. This is an 11.2 volt drop. Let's put this on the right-hand side of the equation where all the drops go. As Kirchhoff's voltage law suggests, for this closed loop, does the summation of voltage rises equal the summation of voltage drops? 8.5 plus 4.3 plus 11.2 does indeed equal 24. In short, the entire 24 volt rise induced by the source is still inevitably dropped in the rearranged circuit. However, the voltage drops are portioned differently between the nodes. All right, here's one more chance to redeem yourself in case you screwed up that last example. Let's say we arrange the circuit once more, such that it's R2, R3, R1. As an exercise to the viewer, I again invite you to use Kirchhoff's voltage law to calculate voltage at node A with respect to D, voltage at node B with respect to D, and voltage at node C with respect to D for the modified circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. As previously, despite the reconfiguration of individual elements, the source still sees 1,330 ohms of total resistance and still pushes roughly 18 million amperes of conventional current clockwise through the system. As a result, R2 still experiences a 4.3 volt drop, positive to negative, top to bottom. R3 still experiences an 8.5 volt drop, positive to negative, top to bottom. And R1 still experiences an 11.2 volt drop, positive to negative, top to bottom. Let's start at node D and travel clockwise in the direction of conventional current from D to A, A to B, B to C, and C back to D. This is the easiest and most sensible way of KVLing the circuit. If you did it in any other manner, you did it wrong. Traveling from D to A, we go in the source negative and come out a positive. This is a 24 volt rise. Where are we on this loop with respect to our starting point? A is clearly 24 volts higher with respect to D. It makes sense. Continuing to travel from A to B, we go in a positive and come out a negative. This is a 4.3 volt drop. Where are we now with respect to our starting point D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts. Then from A to B, we dropped 4.3 volts. It stands to conjecture B is a rise of 24, less a drop of 4.3, or 19.7 volts higher than D. VB, with respect to D, would be 19.7 volts. Continuing to travel from B to C, we again go in a positive, come out a negative. This is an 8.5 volt drop. Where are we now with respect to our starting point D? Well, from D to A, we rose 24 volts. Then from A to B, we dropped 4.3 volts. And then from B to C, we dropped another 8.5 volts. It stands to conjecture C is a rise of 24, less a drop of 4.3, less a drop of 8.5, or 11.2 volts higher than D. VC, with respect to D, would be 11.2 volts. Finally, completing the loop, traveling from C to D, we again go in a positive and come out a negative. This is an 11.2 volt drop. We're back where we started. In short, the entire 24 volt rise induced by the source is still inevitably dropped as we travel the rearranged circuit. However, the voltage drops are apportioned differently between the nodes. If I was to summarize the previous observations regarding rearrangement of individual elements inside series circuits, it would be this. Rearrangement of individual elements inside series circuits does not affect total resistance, current, nor voltage drops across individual elements. It can, however, affect how voltage is apportioned within the circuit. All right, that's about it for today. I initially planned on discussing how opens and shorts in series circuits influence electrical properties. However, this lecture is getting a little long. We'll examine opens and shorts and switches in series circuits and other related topics like the DC voltage divider role and circuit protection in later lectures. Until then, that's all I've got for you today regarding series DC circuits. In conclusion, this lecture took a close look at series DC circuit properties. We learned current through elements in series is the same. And for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises equals the summation of voltage drops. In summary, what goes up must come down. Additionally, we learned that resistors in series add up, and the largest resistor in a series circuit drops the largest amount of voltage and dissipates the largest amount of power. Conversely, the smallest resistor in a series circuit drops the smallest amount of voltage and dissipates the smallest amount of power. Finally, we learned that power in always equals power out, 
and use this and other series circuit properties and Ohm's law to check our work. Finally, finally, we made extensive use of Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine nodal voltages within series circuits and examine how the rearrangement of elements in a series circuit affect these properties. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.